Oh, good afternoon, uh, good morning, depending on where you are joining from us around the globe. Uh, welcome to today's enlightening session on chemistry for a sustainable world. Uh, this discussion is part of the Knowledge Mile series, bringing insights and innovations from the heart of the world to our diverse audience. It's a free online lecture series uh, where we address the connections in and around the square mile and the world's coffee house and how these might help us tackle future global challenges. I'm your host today, Henry, um, joining also uh, from Imperial College, um, which might resonate with today's theme. I'll be guiding this session and later facilitating a dialogue during uh, the Q&A portion. So before we get started, a bit of housekeeping for me, my job as always is to get out of the way as soon as possible. Uh, we'll be doing, this is the schedule, so um, currently running, running into my chairman's introduction. We'll be doing uh, the presentation and then continue on to questions, hoping to finish within 45 minutes. Uh, without further ado, allow me to introduce our esteemed guest in the field of sustainable chemistry, Professor Tom Welton, at, uh, who is the Professor of Sustainable Chemistry at Imperial College London and the Royal Society of Chemistry's Ambassador for Sustainable Chemistry Policy. Professor Welton's contributions to green chemistry are both profound and pivotal. His leadership roles within Imperial College, first as the head of the Department of Chemistry and later as the Dean of the Faculty of Natural Sciences have been instrumental in shaping the next generation of sustainable scientists and science, scientists in general, including myself, as uh, he was a Dean for me. Professor Welton um, has authored over 160 papers across inorganic, organic and physical chemistry and is a true advocate of both sustainable chemistry and diversity in science. His contributions have been recognized with an OBE in the Queen's Birthday Honours in 2017. Today, we are privileged to host a lecture centered around sustainable chemistry, a crucial discipline that bridges the gap between the need for chemical development and the principles of sustainability, ensuring that we meet the current needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet theirs. This aligns with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, uh, providing a framework for a sustainable common future. Um, so without further delay, it's my honor to hand over the platform to Professor Welton. Professor Welton, the virtual stage is yours. Thank you very much, Henry. Let me just get my presentation up. There we go. And I hope you can see that. <clears throat> right, so I'm going to talk to you today about your chemistry for a sustainable world. And I'll give you a little bit of background and then talk about some specific work that we're doing uh, in my group and well in other groups as well at Imperial College and with colleagues across the world. So the first thing you might find surprising is none of this is new. Uh, we think about environmentalism, green, sustainability as very, very new ideas. But you might be surprised to learn that the, you know, the world's first environmental legislation is over 150 years old. And it was here in the UK and the uh, UK Towns Improvement Clause, Clauses Act of 1847, which was followed by the Alkali Act of 1863, had a really profound impact upon the way in which we addressed how the chemical industry's enterprise um, can negatively affect the environment. Now, when this came about, um, it was, you know, highly opposed um, with it claimed that, you know, introducing this kind of control on the chemical industries would lead to the destruction of the chemical industry in the UK. So let's find out what actually happened. Well, first of all, what was it all about? So it was all about the production of something called soda ash. Um, soda ash is sodium carbonate. Now, I've got the chemical equations here for those of you that like that sort of thing. For those of you who are a bit intimidated by them, all you need to know is the colour code, which I will come to in a moment. So soda ash was a requirement for, for making soap. It still is a requirement for making soap. And it has to be said that soap has saved more lives than every pharmaceutical that's ever been made put together. So it's a really important, positive thing in our world. So how was soda ash made? So it was made 
by this route. So you take salt, sodium chloride, same as table salt with um, sulfuric acid, um, the acid which is in the old fashioned lead acid batteries, you would react with them and you'd make something called sodium sulfate and um, some hydrochloric acid. That sodium sulfate you would then heat up with some carbon and some calcium carbonate chalk and that would get you to the sodium carbonate that you were trying to make and also some calcium sulfide and some carbon monoxide. So if you look at the overall reaction here, what you can see is that the sodium carbonate is what you want. And it's roughly a third of what you have made with two thirds of what you've made being the byproducts that you don't want. And particularly one of these byproducts, as I've already mentioned, is HCl, hydrochloric acid, when it's wet. And of course it gets wet because it belches out of your chimney. So you see a picture down at the bottom of your screen of Witness, which was the center of the chemicals industry in the UK at the time. And the HCl came out of the chimneys, uh, mixed with water in the air and rained down as acid rain on the local towns. This, you know, was seen as being a bad thing in general. And so the factory or, um, owners did a very sensible thing. They built taller chimneys. And so now the HCL didn't rain down around, immediately around the factory. In fact, so Witnesses is, is in Cheshire. For those of you who um, don't know the geography of Cheshire, Witness is on the coast. There's then some hills. And then on the other side, you'll see I've got this picture of Downton Abbey, is rural Cheshire. And in rural Cheshire, you had exactly this kind of thing, large rural estates, just like Downton Abbey. And of course, what these were, were another industry. These were the industry of agricultural production. And so now you had the waste from one industry falling as acid rain on another industry leading to widespread um, acid damage to vegetation. And it was this that led to the movement for uh, the environmental legislation. So the factory owners already built taller chimneys. They then stuffed those chimneys essentially with straw, rained water down on them to do what we now call a classic end of pipe solution. So at the end of the process, you put in a control measure, you put this wet straw down, that hopefully absorbs the, um, the hydrogen chloride to make hydrochloric acid, and then it doesn't escape into the environment. The problem is that those um, filters, I suppose we should call them, weren't very effective and didn't really do the job. So what did happen? So here we see some more um, chemical reactions. And again, I just guide you towards the overall reaction because it, it looks more complex. It is more complex. It's a, it's a many step reaction rather than just a two step reaction. But what you can see here is something called the Solve process. And the Solve process was introduced to replace the former LeBanc process. And what you can see here, the overall reaction is you take sodium chloride again, calcium carbonate, and that makes your sodium carbonate plus calcium chloride. And now still half the stuff you make is waste, but the stuff you're making is calcium chloride, which is a perfectly safe solid material, and it's not escaping into the environment in an uncontrolled way. And so this was a more sustainable solution. It was more sustainable because it was less polluting, didn't have the toxic byproduct. But it was also more sustainable in an important other way. It was more profitable. And so that meant that it has sustained. It has literally kept on going. And you can see here there's a picture of a um, Solve uh, process factory uh, from Northwich in 2009. It still exists over 150 years later. So it has sustained, it is sustainable chemistry. Did it lead to the destruction of the UK chemicals industry? Of course not. And in fact, I would claim that it led to a burst of innovation that made 
the UK chemicals industries, which today is a major employer, major export earner, and of course, a hugely profitable industry in its own right. So what that tells us is that there's, there's no real conflict between environmental sustainability and financial sustainability, and the two can be achieved together. And very often, the one requires the other, and you can't have them independently of each other. So there's no conflict here. So let me take you to something that um, is more recent. So this is a, a photograph that you know could have been taken um, in the year that I was born in the early 1960s. And this is, a, a, you can see a foaming river. We'll come back to that. And so we were concerned about uh, the environment, but we had this concept that the earth was sufficiently large that humankind can't affect it on a local scale. So yes, there would be pollution problems, but they would be relatively localized and they would be short term. You know, you could deal with them and we'll talk about how this was dealt with in a moment. You could deal with them and then it was done with. And so where did this foam come from? So this foam came from non-biodegradable detergents. And here they are. So if you look across the bottom here, you can see that in the middle, I have a bio biodegradable linear alkyl benzene sulfonate. That is um, a commercial um, detergent. And on the right hand side, you see another one, which is sodium dodecyl sulfate. And what you'll see about these is these chains here are linear. Whereas on the left hand side, you see a closely related compound where instead of being a linear chain, this is now a branched chain. So this is a branched alkyl benzene sulfonate. And that is a non biodegradable detergent. And we weren't making these as the detergent. These were turning up in a, in a few percent in the, by, in the ordinary detergent that we were making. And that few percent was enough to build up, to lead to pollution in, uh, in, in local rivers, as you would see, and then the foaming of that, because of course, it's non-biodegradable, it's not going anywhere. So how did this problem get solved? It was actually from a completely different area of chemistry. So here is, you can see a picture at the bottom there of something which is called a zeolite. You don't need to worry about it in, uh, in detail. It's a silicon, aluminium, oxygen um, compound, and they make these three dimensional structures with, as you can see from the picture, holes in the middle. And those holes are really important because what that enables the zeolite to, to do is to be what we call a molecular sieve. Some molecules can fit inside that hole and some can't. And so by using the right size and um, the right size hole in this case was five angstrom, we could se separate not the detergents, but the precursors to the detergent, so the kind of C10, C14 alkane, alkanes from oil fractions, we could separate the linear ones out. And then we could use them exclusively to make our detergents. And so therefore you could make a reliably biodegradable detergent. And indeed you do. And now we come to something which is important here uh, to mention, which is greenwashing. You can go into your local supermarket and you can see on the shelf many, many, let's say, washing up liquids, some of which will say biodegradable on the bottle. And you can go and you can pay a little bit more because you want to have a biodegradable detergent. All detergents in the UK, Europe, the US are biodegradable by law. And so that label of biodegradable detergent is in fact meaningless because every detergent on your supermarket shelf is biodegradable by law. Don't be fooled by greenwashing. But of course, that idea of local and short term, we now know was wrong. And here you can see some pictures that I just you know, grabbed off the internet of Plastics, you know, and plastics are absolutely everywhere to the extent of, I want you to see this little map here on the left hand side. 
And you can see in the middle of the map, there is a tiny little dot, which is an island called Henderson Island. And as you can see, it's in the middle of the Pacific. It is probably as far away from any significant human habitation as you can get. And yet, look at the pictures on the right hand side. These are the beaches of Henderson Island, and they are literally strewn with plastics. And so plastics are everywhere, not just local. And why are they everywhere? And so here you can see, well, they're everywhere. We use them everywhere plastics in ways that we might be very aware of. And you can see I've got a plastic chair, some plastic bottles, some pens, plastics in ways that you maybe don't necessarily think of. And you, you can have uh, plastic threads, not, not every thread is cotton. And even more, plastics in liquid formulations. And that's what the paint represents here. When you paint that paint on your wall, what it leaves behind is a film of plastic on your wall. So plastics are everywhere because we use them everywhere. And this pie chart here, I think is, is very interesting. So this pie chart is everything that is made by the petrochemicals industry that is not fuel. So of course, the vast bulk of, of what's made is fuel by mass. Here by mass, is what is the rest of it. And you can see essentially 80% of the, of the petrochemical production by mass is in fact plastics. So again, plastics are everywhere. They are the vast bulk of what we make. And beyond that, we need to think about how we use them. So most plastics are just, we use them, we use them once and we discard them. And already you can, we know that things like um, plastic stirrers at um, fast food restaurants have been made illegal. So as we've started to try and address this. But this um, graph shows you for the whole of plastic production. And so the, the unit here is millions of metric tons. So 8,300 have been made in time. Uh, two, 2,500 are still in use. And, you know, if I think about my home, you know, I think about the, the cutlery drawer in my kitchen, that's over 30 years old. And so, you know, lots of plastics are designed to be durable so that they can last a long time. The little blue stream at the bottom is the thing I want you to focus on. And that is how many times plastics have been recycled once. So of those 8,300, only 600 million metric tons have been recycled once. And then believe it or not, there is another line that you can barely see and only 100 million tons have ever been recycled twice. So most plastics end up discarded and very often discarded in the environment. So this is a, a report by the Royal Society of Chemistry about, you know, what do we need to do in order to, to make um, plastic sustainable? And they concluded we need to understand the impacts that plastics have throughout their life cycles. We need to develop new sustainable plastics, we need to have closed loop plastics recycling for the, you may have heard of the circular economy. And of course, we have to understand and control plastic degradation because we do want plastics to be able to degrade. But then on the other hand, that I don't want that paint on my wall to start peeling off after six months. It needs to be durable. So we need to control um, degradation. But I'm going to talk today about some work we're doing at Imperial College on developing new sustainable plastics. And so there are many natural polymers and there are things like cellulose, lignin, which you can find in wood. There are things like chitin and chitosan that you can find in uh, crustacean sh um, shells. And of course, there are proteins like keratin, which is a component of all. And we've been asking ourselves the question, can we combine these in order to make replacements for the things that are currently made from petrochemical plastics? Of course, one of the problems with these is, if you think trees, crabs and wool, 
they don't dissolve. <laughs> they have evolved to be insoluble. And so we need to address that problem. And we do it with these things called ionic liquids. So very briefly, if you heat a salt, it's going to melt. This is um, sodium chloride table salt. Unfortunately, 801 degrees isn't a lot of use to anybody. If you try to dissolve those materials in something at that temperature, they would just burn. But by clever design, you can make liquids that are salts and liquid at room temperature. And these have some very, very, very interesting solubility properties. And we use these. And so I'm going to use the example of lignocellulose biomass. Lignocellulose biomass is wood. And it's made, it's, it's produced on billion tons scale, um, can be agricultural waste. And so we get away from the food versus fuel or food versus chemicals debate, because we're not, if you look at this um, uh, wheat here, we're not talking about the edible seeds, we're talking about the store the bits which are unedible. And so there's no competition with food production. And in fact, you can think about lignocellulose biomass as a way of dealing with agricultural waste. This is what we're interested in. So if we look into that wood, of course, um, we find the cells of the wood. And we're not interested in the liquid middle. There are many, many, many interesting compounds that can be extracted from the, the rich source of chemicals that are inside the cell. We're interested in the cell wall. And the cell wall is made up of three polymers, cellulose, which is a glucose polymer, which packs into stacks and so then into uh, fibers. Lignin, lignin is the brown bit of wood essentially. So as the, the wood toughens after initial growth, you're seeing the deposition of lignin and hemicellulose sticks the whole lot together. Here they are chemically, so you have cellulose, a glucose um, polymer, lignin, which is an aromatic, aromatic means it contains these six membered rings that you, you can see, and then hemicellulose, which is another sugary polymer. And of course, the first thing you have to do is separate these things. And so you need to separate those components and then that gives you some kind of availability for treatment for the cellulose, the lignin and indeed the, the hemicellulose. The only problem is, as we know, wood is not very soluble and so that's the difficult thing to do. So let me introduce you to now Dr. Aggie Brandtall, but at the time that this work was done, she was actually a PhD student in my research group. She's now um, a lecturer at Imperial College in her own right. And here we have a, a story of, of not just um, uh, the, uh, not just the, the, the science itself, but also the role of serendipity in scientific discovery. And so she was doing a project where she was, you know, taking bits of wood, you know, pine, um, willow and miscanthus. So pine is a soft wood, willow is a hard wood, miscanthus is a grass. So of course we had the different varieties of, of wood there. She would take different ionic liquids, try and make a solution of them, um, and then um, add some uh, water to re-precipitate um, the cellulose material. And, and then you know, and she was doing this and, and getting some, interesting but not necessarily earth-shattering results. Here's one particular ionic liquid. You don't need to worry about the formula for those of you who do understand um, such things. This is a butyl methyl imidazolium hydrogen sulfate. It's the hydrogen sulfate ion, which is the important bit here. And it is the anion that you get if you take one proton away from sulfuric acid. And she was using this ionic liquid to try and do her experiments. And you could see what she got was sticky black mess, no use to anybody. She then uh, went away on holiday, um, came back and tried some other experiments and found actually what she made was some beautiful, in fact, cellulose. So, oh, well, Aggie, go, now go and repeat the experiment, back to sticky black mess. What was going on here? And we sat and we thought and, and then we realized she went on holiday. And because she went on holiday, 
she had forgotten you make the ionic liquid and then what you do is you dry it so you have a nice dry ionic liquid with which to do your experiments but she made the ionic liquid before she went on holiday and forgot when she came back that she hadn't dried it and so what we discovered was what you needed to do was not use a, the dry ionic liquid in fact you wanted to add water to the ionic liquid in order to get the best results and so this is what she managed to do so she took her wood she dissolved it in uh, her hydrogen sulfate ionic liquids and then she could separate the cellulose as uh, initially just straightforward solid material didn't dissolve in the first place she filtered it out and then had a solution of lignin which she could then add water to to <coughs> excuse me make lignin powder so she could separate the biomass components and not only could she do it in um, a round bottom flask that you could hold in your hand this is aggie in a completely different photograph now standing on top of the reactor at her spin out company Lixaya. so we call this the ionosolve process and so aggie together with um, jason hallett who is a professor in chemical engineering at imperial college used to be a postdoc in my group as well and they have taken that process and turned it into the beginnings of an industrial process so in 2022 there was which is what you see there was the pilot plant operating at 10 tons a year now this year they should be opening the demonstration plant which is 20,000 pounds uh 20,000 20,000 20, tons per year and we would hope in a few years time to expand to full commercial scale so we see that this mistake made on going from ho on holiday has turned into this commercial production of uh, biomass components so what's the synthetic challenge with these things how can we bring these things so we need to make we do need to actually try in some cases try and replicate the the materials that we have today from renewable sources but actually what we will do most of the time is we we want to have material properties so you know my water bottle needs to hold water i don't particularly care what material it is so we want to make new materials that can match the properties of currently available materials and of course in making these trying to make these materials we will make new materials that have new properties that we currently don't even know that we want and we will have those and so um so here are some things that we are doing at imperial college now just as i finish and so we have been making films for packaging, which of course, in terms of single use plastics, it, packaging is the, is the biggest use of single use plastics. And so making films for packaging from biomass polymers. And at the bottom there, you see a collaboration we have with um, the University of Bristol, where we're making biomass fibers for conversion into carbon fibers, to make carbon fibers. And so finally, I would just leave you with these. So these are the sustainable development goals. If you don't know them, look them up. There are 17 of them. Some of them are very clearly technical. So affordable and clean energy. Others are more societal, like um, gender equality. But I would absolutely argue completely that chemistry and chemical scientists have something to contribute to every single one of these sustainable development goals. So with that, thank you very much. And back to you, Henry. That's a nice picture of the sustainability goals. I remember dealing with those before. So thank you, Professor Walton, for such a you know insightful presentation. I think everyone can agree on the importance of um, sustainable practices and not just in chemistry, but beyond and showing us um, how, you know, chemistry is, especially on your side, producing new solutions to the current problems. I have a few questions um, uh, in the thing. So if anyone's got any more questions, please type them now. I have one from uh, Hugh Purser who says, could you comment on seaweed as an alternative source of plastic-like products? Or have you seen any research related yeah. to that? It was around the time of the lignin. Lignin so yeah, so alginates um, particularly are yeah, already they're being produced on a relatively smaller scale. To you can you can buy little 
bags, I suppose you'd say, um, of water where the, um, the polymer holding the bag is derived from seaweed and you just pop the whole lot in your mouth it dissolves and you drink the water all in one it all in one part so so these things exist yeah and so i don't you know i just i just showed three because that's the number i could fit on the screen <laughs> reasonably there are many 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 polymers out there in nature and and so the the kind of broad project that i call it is the unnatural combination of natural polymers so what i'm particularly interested in is of course you can use, i mean cellulose is used as cellulose for instance this shirt is cotton so that's therefore cellulose but if we take these these polymers with their their own particular properties and and just like petrochemical prop, uh, polymers very rarely do we actually use them absolutely just one polymer with no additive very often there are things called composites, which are you know, more than one polymer together, either on a chemical basis mixed or layered or something like that. And I'm particularly interested in, so what properties can you drag out of natural polymers by making composites of natural polymers that don't actually meet in nature? So if you use chitosan from um, a crab shell and uh, made a composite of that with lignin from a tree, would that extend the range of properties that we can achieve with these natural polymers so therefore being able to replace the um, synthetic polymers that we currently use interesting so i think um shane uh also has a question saying um while removing these compounds from the manufacturing process will stop further environmental pollution there is still an issue of the existing pollution how can we mm. go about removing non-biogradable pollutants like PFCs from the environment with great difficulty is the it is the answer so the the problem is dilution so we take um so you know something that we we're, we're going to use for you know whether it's a solid or a liquid or even a gas you know and you've got it in a concentrated form when it leaks out into the environment it spreads and so it's present but in, often in very highly dilute forms and so you know if you want to try and reconcentrate those that's an extremely difficult task even for something like plastics where you know you have you know millimeter or or in some cases centimeter or, or even meter sized objects it's extremely difficult there are people who are uh, attempting those challenges but they are early you know relatively early stage things Interesting. We've got a further question from Dominique uh, saying, how energy intensive is the process to create natural polymers compared to plastic? Oh, so at the moment, highly. <laughs> and so, oh, really? so that's, much more. That's much more. So the, the, the you know, one of the ways in which the, the, the plastics that we currently use have come about is um, because, you know, back in the days when many of they were being selected from the range of possible polymers will include in it within it the ease of making and so for the energy and in, energy intensity of making and the the extraction of natural polymers is still at such an early stage in its development that that frankly yeah it's much it's much more energy intensive than making for instance something like um polyethylene Okay. Um, there's another question from Keith Robertson. He's wondering, basically, have you written a book on this and can you read it? Well, his actual question is, has <laughs> Professor Wells and Nicole been able to compress their body of knowledge into a limited technical book? So not to miss quote. So, um, I, I haven't. Um, there are many books on, uh, sometimes it's called sustainable chemistry, sometimes it's called green chemistry. In fact, more often it's called, it, it's been called green chemistry. And so if you, I, if you Google that, you'll find that there are many books out there that of greater or lesser technical content and you'll be able to find one which is just right for you i am intending to write one it's just <laughs> you know, time yeah well without gpt you know writing is is difficult yeah. yeah so um one more question from charles henderson he says with the reference to your slides on what happens to plastics as in most of it goes to waste if more was burned what are the problems that that, that these can be solved by chemistry so uh, there's a kind of 
hierarchy of what you would want to do. And so, of course, the first thing you, with some plastic material you have, you'd want to continue, literally just continue using it. You would want it to remain in that first purpose um, for as long as possible. You would want to reuse. So reuse is using something for the same purpose for which it was originally made. And so you want repeated use. Every time you repeat use, then less virgin, as we call it, plastic is made. If you can't reuse, <clears throat> what you want to do is recycle. So that means take it back into a system and put it through a process and it comes out still as the same material, but being used for another purpose. Then you start getting to what might you do next. So one of the things that's being researched a lot at the moment, isn't really done yet, is something called chem cycling. So you take the, you take the polymer and you make it back to the monomer from which that polymer was made and then you make new virgin because it would be virgin again um polymer from that that but then you get to we can't if we can't do that then you have your what do we do to dispose and it's only at that stage you would start to consider something like any euphemism we call it energy recovery which is using it, burning it, incinerating it, reclaim the energy, and then use that as an energy supply. And then beyond that, you then start getting to, you know, responsible disposal. And so you try and you, you try and go as high up that hierarchy as you possibly can. And with current materials, that is often difficult. And of course, that's what a lot of people are aiming at, which is trying to get as high up that um, as you can. And of course, then there is the trying to make biodegradable polymers. Um, but at the moment, biodegradable doesn't mean what most people think biodegradable means. So biodegradable does not mean I can take this piece of plastic and chuck it out of my car window. And it doesn't matter because uh, in a few weeks time, it will have degraded in the environment. When we call something biodegradable at the moment, what we mean is it will biodegrade in an industrial composter. And so that's it. So it's important that even your biodegradables are properly disposed of because biodegradable doesn't mean it will just disappear in the environment in a short time. Hmm. I was wondering, did you um, do you think any particular countries or or particular groups of countries are leading the way with this sustainable uh, kind of uh, approach? Yeah, I mean, perhaps not, perhaps not surprisingly, the richer the country, the more it has to invest invest in this you know the great heroes of recycling are the swiss um they have you know far 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 more sophisticated recycling than we do say here in the uk um there's a lot of you know across europe the Euro european union has programs to do research in this area the us does here in the uk we do there's a, a lot of research um going on it is early days with with much of it as well but yeah so you know the the the, the post-industrial um west is doing particularly well investing in this but china as well and china, you'll be be surprised how much investment china makes into sustainability would you say it's still a case of not building taller chimneys but perhaps moving the problem to other countries is that still well so that has been a problem and um you know the united nations has uh, has got conventions now to address that problem that you can't you can't solve your problem by dumping it on somebody else's doorstep um and so that is now and actually i should say in in that process so we are literally at the moment in the process of setting up the equivalent so many of you will know about the ipcc um the intergovernmental panel on climate control it's the advisory group that ends up when you hear about cop um it's the advisory group that puts the science into cop and we're at the, pro at the moment now where the un is setting up an equivalent of that for chemicals waste and the prevention of pollution and so oh, if things go well by the summer, by the end of the year, we should be at the place where that science policy interface, it's called, um, is in place so that the best science can be used to inform the policy, not just for you know the rich nations, but for everyone. 
Interesting. And then I always have this kind of question is saying, you know, if anyone in the audience or, or beyond is particularly impacted by, not impacted, but impactful to themselves and they want to learn more about this um, or get involved, do you know the best best route for them to sort of learn more about sustainable chemistry or maybe move, you know, to, to how I would, you, what you I would hit the Royal Society of Chemistry website. You know, there's some okay. brilliant resources. And again, across a range of knowledge levels, you know, so some of them are designed for people who know almost I mean, a lot of it is in the education bit. So you'll see it in the school stuff. Um, uh, but a lot of it is for people who have almost no chemical knowledge through all the way through to chemistry professors. And so I would absolutely start I'd start with there. there. They've been there have been some great reports, the report on polymers in liquid formulations, the report on scarce elements are something we haven't talked about today, which is, you know, why you should make sure that you take that um, old uh, mobile phone out of the back of the drawer and have it recycled properly. Um, the um, scarce elements of the RSC tells you that story very well. Okay, so recycle your mobile phones. Oh, we've got one more question, I think. Oh, please give the address of that website, but I think we'll we'll add that. But, but so if you just it literally, if you just Google Royal Society of Chemistry, you'll hit the website. So I think that's good. So um, yeah, and thank you all for your questions. As we conclude the um, session today, I'd want to extend my, well, I don't want to, I am extending my um, you know, heartfelt and sincere gratitude to Professor Welton for sharing his expertise and insights, which um, shows a significant role uh, chemistry plays in ach achieving a sustainable future. Uh, his contributions, yeah, I, I, think, I think it's pretty, pretty clear to see um, that how this can change the world. So um, a big thank you to our audience and for engaging uh, you know, for the engaging questions and joining us uh, for this important conversation. And, uh, you know, this is just one one step towards, uh, you know, how we can achieve these SDGs and whatnot. And I hope to see you all in upcoming lectures, uh, which are coming up here. So we've got what's happening to religion in England coming up. Oh, that's literally in two days. Uh, a world in debt. Is this the global monster? Or whatever. So here they are, 15th of February. How pollinator friendly is the city of London? So we've got a load of these these going on and they'll also be on YouTube. So um, if you if you miss the beginning or middle or the end of this, it should be retrievable on uh, online platforms. And uh, yes, thank you again for everyone, uh, organizers and uh, panelists alike. And uh, yeah, look forward to seeing you in another session. And thank you very much, Professor Welton, for joining us. Thank you.